Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I haven't said anything yet, so that's incredibly nice of you. Um, firstly, I have no idea what he said, but I'm hoping he said, he said kind things. And um, can I say it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've now spent a, uh, yesterday here in Bratislava and today, and um, it's brilliant to be here, and it's brilliant to be working with you guys as students, because hopefully what I say may in some way, you might remember something. Um, I don't think you'll fall asleep. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, and I hope that some of the experiences that I can bring, um, you will find interesting both in your courses here at university, but also in, this is real life, but there's another real life as well, um, after university. Um, I want to talk about, I've had, I, um, I've had 25 years of, I'll tell you my life, I was at Cambridge University in England many, many, many years ago. And then I did a master's in business administration for one year after Cambridge. And I didn't know what to do. And you might have the same problem afterwards. You don't know what you want to do. So I thought I would, advertising sounded like fun. So it, can you hear me? Is this microphone working? Yeah? Can you hear? Yeah. And so I, I decided to go and work for an advertising agency, which was really interesting. Um, but for me, only interesting up to a point. And I spent about seven, eight years working in an advertising agency, and I was in my mid-twenties, and it was great fun, and I loved it. But the problem with it was that um, I never was really in control of what I was doing, because if you work in the world of media for advertising, you have these things called clients, who, are, who can be fantastic and also very annoying, because they often do the wrong things, but they have the money, <laughs> and that's quite difficult. So after about seven years, and in that time I went and worked in New York. I worked for an advertising agency in New York. And if any of you get the chance to work in America, take it, even if you don't even know what you want to do there. I was about 25, and I'd worked in London for maybe two or three years. And, uh, and I resigned to go work for a different advertising agency and for a little bit more money because I didn't know what I wanted. And the boss of the advertising agency said to me, OK, he's going to offer you, they're going to give you 500 more pounds, 1,000 more euros, whatever. What do you really want to do? And I didn't really know. And I said, I looked at him, and I don't know why. It came into my head. I just said, you know, I want to go and work in New York. He picked up the phone. <laughs> he, he rang the New York office and said, hey, I've got this guy, Mark Sands. He's pretty cool. He's going to get on a plane tonight, and he's going to be in New York for the weekend, and can you see him on Monday morning? And I was like, ah. <laughs> And I got on a plane, I went to New York, I had a great time, I interviewed on Monday morning, I had a job on Monday afternoon, and then four weeks later I was living in New York. So life has an amazing, you can it's just, just invent things because things happen. And then I spent three years in New York and I came back and I worked a little bit more in advertising. And then I was asked to go and join um, what was a, a satellite television company to be the marketing director of a satellite, it was called British Digital Broadcasting. It was called On Digital. And I was there for three years, and it was an unbelievable failure. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, which, of course, was not my fault. I blame the technology. It was, uh, it was, it, 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 it didn't really work. And for those of you who are ever going into combat with any company owned by Rupert Murdoch, the likelihood is you will lose. <laughs> Um, because they, despite all the problems that they're having in England at the moment, and I'll talk about that later, they're a phenomenal organization. They are killers, and they killed us. But before we died, I was, I was, <laughs> I was rung up by... Um, um, and I'm telling you this because some people will ask you, what do you want to do in your career? What do you want to do? And it's fine not to know. Okay, I don't have a five-year plan, I don't have a 10-year plan, I didn't really have, certainly didn't have a 15-year plan, I had a sort of month-by-month -month plan. And uh, I got a call and someone said, would you come in, would you be interested in starting as one of the directors of a recruitment website? Yeah, so online jobs, this was, this was before recruitment websites were the norm, this was 1999, okay, long, long time, this was one of the first ever... And I went and I interviewed and I, and I talked to them and it was quite interesting and they were going to give me the job. And then I said, you know, I don't want this job because I'm not interested in recruitment advertising, actually. But the company that owned the recruitment advertising was the Guardian Media Group. And the Guardian, have you heard of the Guardian newspaper? 
yeah? It's an absolutely brilliant news organization. And for those, did you, have you followed the, hack, the hacking story in England? Yeah, where they listen to people's phones, yeah? Well, that's the news organization. And I met the managing director, and she said, she said to me, would you be interested in come to join The Guardian? And I was like, that would be fantastic. She said, come and meet the editor. So I met the editor of The Guardian, who it so happened lived in the same street as me, so I knew him anyway. And, uh, and I said, hello, and blah, 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 blah. And then a month later, I was working at The Guardian, and I worked at The Guardian for 10 years. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about here, okay? But I'm going to talk about other things as well, but it's a lot about my experiences in the media. Now, although I'm going to talk about the media, you can extrapolate points from what I'm saying to absolutely anything. Because the thing about marketing and the thing about business, in many respects, it doesn't really matter what you're in. What matters is that you fully understand the principles of what you're trying to do. Because you can apply them to anything. And people often don't think that. They think it's different for this or it's different for that. It's basically the same. So choose carefully. And then after 10 years, I decided to change. And about 18 months ago, uh, if you've been to London, have you been to the Tate Gallery? Yeah? Who's been to Tate Modern? Put your hand up. Yeah. So I now am the marketing director, the director of communications for the Tate Gallery, which, which is a gallery in London. There's two galleries in London, one in Liverpool in the north of England and one in the south in Cornwall. And about, it has 7.4 million visitors a year. Okay? It's an unbelievable art gallery that is probably one of the world's most important galleries. And that's where I'm working now. But that's not what I'm going to talk. What I want to talk about is, is, is media and the media landscape. And the funny thing is, is I think we are in a period of unbelievable uncertainty when it comes to the media. And you will hear experts talking to you, and you will hear people saying, well, you should like this, or it's like that. The truth is, I don't really think right now that many people know exactly what they're talking about, because it used to be so simple. It used to be, 10 years ago, it was very, very easy. It's now incredibly complicated, and the rules of the game have changed. And I'm going to talk about, particularly about newspapers in a bit, but you will notice that there's talk about newspapers in crisis, journalism in crisis. The truth is that journalism is not in crisis, but what has happened is that the business model that underpins journalism is in complete crisis. So the, uh, people are consuming more journalism than has ever been the case before, but the business case underneath it is crumbling. But it used to be whatever marketing you did was very straightforward. And then something crazy happened, which was this digital thing. And no one really knew what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. But the world exploded. And you guys, are, you have grown up in that world. But I'm 47, and when I grew up, it, it was, you just didn't know what had hit you. Suddenly, boom, this thing had happened where everything was possible, everyone could do everything, and the world of media was no longer restricted to those who owned it. It became a far bigger proposition. And in practical terms, um, choice exploded. This is in, in England, okay? But it'll be the same in Slovakia. It'll be, just be different numbers. And what you have here is that TV channels in 1993, there were 26. It went to 271. National press, sections of the press, went from 31 to 70. Cinema screens exploded. There were many more. Radio stations went crazy. And internet penetration, imagine 0.5% internet penetration. It seems unbelievable. And in, uh, and in uh, 2002, it was 43%. It's estimated now, if you go to 2012, that internet penetration in the UK is 74%. I think it will be higher. This was predicted about a year ago. But it's not 100%. It's not like television receivership. Now, depending on where you are in the world, and I've done a lot of work in China, and I've done a lot of work in Nigeria, it is the same everywhere. The only difference is the manner in which people receive the internet. I've worked a lot with Nigerian media organizations, and for them, fixed-line computers, forget it. But if you think people in Nigeria or Africa aren't online, you're wrong. They all are, but it's all through their telephones. In China, it's the same. It's through their phone rather than fixed line um, uh, uh, internet access. So there's been an absolute crushing explosion of media, which if you work in marketing now, in the old days, if you worked in marketing, all you had to do is you make a television campaign, you make a radio campaign, you make a poster. It was really simple. And that's how you got your brand message across. Now, if you're, um, and, and Martin, who, who introduced me, is, is, works in marketing for one of the banks here, 
His job is so much harder now than the person who did his job 15 years ago because he has so many choices and it's not clear which are the right choices. And the internet has allowed marketing to become no longer a function of the marketing department, but a function of the organization as a whole. And if you talk in organizations where I'm at the Tate, I now require everyone in the organization. I'm responsible for the online process for the Tate, and I was for the Guardian. But it's an organizational problem, not a problem for the marketing department. And lots of organizations still don't realize this. So Rupert Murdoch, the lovely Rupert, he said, this was you know, in 2006, uh, talking about the internet, to find something comparable, you have to go back 500 years to the printing press, the birth of mass media. Technology is shifting power away from the editors, the publishers, the establishment, and the media elite. Now it's the people who are taking control. That's sort of true, but in another way, I think it's not true. Because even as little as two or three years ago, everyone in this room could be a journalist. Well, I think all of you can be bloggers, but I don't think you can all be journalists. And there's a real distinction between the two. And that distinction became somewhat grey, and I think now people are understanding that there is something called journalism, and there's something called commenting, and there's something called blogging, and they're very different things. And for a period, for the last four or five years, we confused them all together. We believed that the opinion of a blogger was the same as the opinion of a journalist. That is true, but the journalist hopefully has the facts, and the facts is what really distinguishes media organizations. So companies are completely losing control. Now this re relates to either newspaper companies, toilet paper companies, any company you like. In the old days, it used to be that the brand would transmit the message and was in complete control of the brand. And you would say, my newspaper is better, my toilet cleaner cleans better, my toilet paper wipes better, whatever you want. And the, <laughs> and the target market here would say, yeah, okay, I believe you, I'll buy this, I'll buy that. Or they'd say, no, it's not for me. And it was really simple. And you would put out these messages and people sort of trusted advertising. There's been something of a crisis in confidence. I don't know how much people trust advertising in the way that they used to. I think they're right to be suspicious in some cases, not in all cases. So we move from a mass communication model to a very much a targeted marketing model where it became some sort of dialogue between uh, the brand and its customers. Now, if you're a newspaper, it's really easy to have a dialogue between you and your readers, because what you're doing is intrinsically interesting, and your readers want to discuss it with you. If you're a manufacturer of toilet paper, I'm not sure that the people buying your product particularly want to have a dialogue with you. Um, <laughs> maybe they do. And, and if you look at some of the websites of some of the, and I'm choosing a, a, you know, a polar extreme. There's lots of, of brands in the middle. And the trick for those brands who, because the marketing is, is a funny thing. I think there's lots of definitions of marketing, but I think the biggest definition of marketing is making things that are basically not very interesting appear to be very interesting. And that's a real skill. If you work in newspapers or you work for an art gallery, what you do is intrinsically interesting anyway because the content is fascinating. The content of a newspaper to most people, or the content of an art gallery to many people, is very interesting. So the skill of marketing is to present it to people in a way. If I'm manufacturing this bottle of water, this could be any water, but bon aqua, someone has to make that interesting to the point that you buy this one rather than mitika, whatever this one is. <laughs> um, I'm sure I've said that wrong, but that's the skill. The success of marketing is to make you want this one more than this one, even though this one is probably, no, they're both fizzy, so they're both the same. You take the name off, you can't tell the difference. So that is basically the skill of marketing. And for a period, they moved it from, a, from an immediate one-to-one -one conversation. What's happening now is different and even more scary, is that the brand, which used to have such control, and the marketing director, Michael, used to have such control, and I used to have such control, I don't have that control anymore, because the brand is there, but there's a million conversations happening between the audiences themselves. And actually, for a newspaper, that's a really good thing. 
because you are developing a community of people who are discussing the subjects that you're putting out there. I'm not sure it's the same if you're marketing... Coca-Cola is different because Coca-Cola will ally themselves to football or they'll ally themselves to ice hockey or whatever. But it's very difficult for brands to operate in this world. And it's been a massive shift in the way. And I think that shift will only become worse. And if you make a mistake as the brand... If you made a mistake here, you could sort of get away with it. If you make a mistake here as the brand director, you're in real trouble because people will kill you. And they will, you know, your brand will die very... And there are many examples where companies have made terrible mistakes and the audiences have slaughtered them. So there's been a complete shift in the way it's done. I want to talk now, if I can, about The Guardian newspaper, where I spent 10 years. And before I go in, I, I want to explain a bit about The Guardian newspaper. The Guardian newspaper is... Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I've got no internet access here, so I can't show you online. But after this, or tomorrow, or sometime, go and have a look at that newspaper. The newspaper is very old. I'm going to give you its history, but it's, a, it's only the ninth biggest selling newspaper in England. It sells about 280,000 copies a day. But online, it is the second biggest newspaper in England and the eighth biggest newspaper in the world online. And part of the story is I'm going to tell you how we actually did that and actually what happened. In the world now, there's about, last month, about 48 million people access The Guardian last month, but only about 250,000 buy it. Now, of those 48 million, there's about 15, 16 million in the UK, about 15, 16 million in America and Canada, and the rest, about another 15, 16 million in the English-speaking parts of the world. What The Guardian has now done is also available to, you can translate it, it's available in Arabic, it's also available in New York, so they're taking their business model out to where the readers and customers are. But I'm going to give you a media marketing case study so you really understand what we did. And um, I think, uh, hopefully, you'll find it interesting. This is what The Guardian used to look like. In 1988, this was a really radical design. Everyone thought, this is the way a modern newspaper should present itself. And it was famously looked like this. In 2005, um, newspaper sales were going down, and they are all over the world. And we decided that this was time to change what the newspaper looked like. The newspaper in size became smaller, and uh, we changed the look and feel. And it looked like this, changed to that. Uh, the Guardian, interestingly, when we change from the first... When you look at brand logos, people think that it's all about the brand logo. It isn't. And we really... This is one of the most famous newspaper brand logos in Europe. And we looked at it and we thought, can we change it? Can't we change it? Should we change it? Oh, my God, it's going to be a disaster if we change it. No one's going to recognize it. A brand is what exists in people's head. If you say The Guardian, not you necessarily, but in England, I can guarantee you, it will give it, people will have a very, very strong opinion. When I was uh, one of the directors of The Guardian, you go to dinner parties, you'd say, hi, what do you do? Hello, I work at The Guardian. Ugh. Some people were like, amazing, fantastic, must be wonderful. And others were like, that is terrible. Because it's a very politically aligned newspaper. And it's a very, very liberal newspaper. It, is of, it, it has no political persuasion. But it is, if you talk to people who read The Guardian, they almost certainly are left of centre. Centre and left of centre. So it polarises opinion. And my view of the strongest newspaper brands, the weakest newspaper brands, are those where when you say here's the name of the newspaper, what do you think? People go, no, I don't know, it's all right, it's not that good. But the best brands are ones where people love it or they hate it, certainly in the world of media. Not so good if you're a toilet paper brand, but if you're in the world of media, <laughs> you want people love you or they really hate you, and that is a really strong place to be. And The Guardian, you ask anyone, when you go to London or you meet English people, do you read The Guardian? If they say yes, they'll talk to you about it for hours. If they say oh, no, they'll dismiss it very quickly and say, it's not for me. But my point is, is that the brand is what is elicited in people's heads. It is not in a typeface. And people often think it's in a typeface. And it's very, very difficult conversation to change like this. And we changed this in 2005. It was, I think, September the 12th, 2005. And we told the company everything. We said, on this day we're going to change, and it's going to look like this. But we did not show them the new typeface. That's the one thing we kept behind. 
Because if, you, if you're trying to do a change in marketing, most people don't care. You have to slap people in the face to take notice. And when you change from this to this, and you go out in the morning and you buy your newspaper, you're like, whoa, what's that? Is that the same paper? Yes, it is. But you have to really, if you're going to make a change, make a really radical change. Little changes do very little. People don't notice, because largely people don't care. You think they care, but they don't. So that is what we changed to. At the same time, the website was growing, the website was growing, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So The Guardian was actually started in 1821. So it's really old. And it was born out of social injustice. In 1819, in the north of England in Manchester, there was a riot where 11 people were killed. And it wasn't reported by the press. And various people thought this was totally wrong to have a riot. And the people who, who were killed by the forces and the police, it was not reported. So about 18 months later, they set up the Guardian newspaper. And the Guardian was a local newspaper in Manchester. And interestingly, if you ask people about it, they'll say the Guardian, well, it's left-wing. It isn't left-wing at all. It has no political affiliation. And if you read it, it has people from the left, from the centre, from the right, all of whom are right in it. Because the view of the Guardian is that people should be allowed all sides of any discussion or argument. Um, it's also a newspaper that has moved from a digital newspaper, from a newspaper on paper to a digital paper. And they've done this. Now, the thing about digital is you have no idea where you're going. But one thing is sure is that all of you are going to be in a digital world. How many of you buy a newspaper? <laughs> How many of you get your news online? Yeah. That's all you need to know. Um, now, I'm a bit older than you. My parents are older than you. I have two sons, one 15, one 13. They read the newspaper because their dad worked there and their mum works at Reuters, so their news crazy. We force them to watch them because we're evil parents. So we force, them, we force them to read the paper. But actually, they don't want to. They do it all online. And, so, and The Guardian took the view in 1998 that whatever happens, you have to follow the audience. You can say, I don't want to do digital. You can say it's not for me, but you have to follow the audience. And so from 1998 to today, it has been full down one 100% digital, even though it is not clear where the money is coming from. Because in the old days, in a newspaper, the business model is very easy. It is basically your revenue is 70% advertising, 70-80% to 80 advertising revenue, 20-30% to 30 copy price, what you actually buy the newspaper for. And it's really simple. And the pr you keep the price of the papers very low to ensure that many people buy them, and therefore you can put your advertising rates up. It's dead simple. That's completely changed now. And the model has changed. It used to be 70, 80% of revenue as advertising. It's now between 40 and 55%. And the price of a newspaper is going up, so less people are buying it. So the advertising revenue goes down and the price of the paper goes up. It's a terribly, terribly vicious circle. But that's what's happening. And I'm sure it's happening here too. But in that 12, 13 years, it's become one of the leading media brands in the world. And it's done it partly through the strength of its marketing, a little bit, but mostly through the strength of the journalism. And the skill in marketing a media brand is not to invent stuff. The skill is to just bring it, as it is, to the potential readers. Do not make little furry toys or little furry animals to sell things that are interesting. You don't need to, because they already are. And this is what the, the Guardian is all about. It is there to exist that liberal journalism can exist in perpetuity, which sounds really weird. But it is there only to make sure that liberal journalism exists in perpetuity. And in the statutes of the Guardian, it says that the Guardian shall be profit-seeking, not profit-maximizing. So just think about that for a moment. Profit-seeking, not profit-maximizing. That leads to, to a very, very different type of organization. That leads to a newspaper that will do stories that other people wouldn't do. That's why the hacking story was a Guardian story. It's not necessarily because Guardian journalists are better than journalists in other newspapers. It's because they are given the time to develop stories and work them out. And the hacking story took about two to three years of hard work to do which is very expensive, but in the end, it meant it was a big story. 
Why do you think WikiLeaks, and do you remember the WikiLeaks thing last year when it all came out, was given to The Guardian, Der Spiegel, and The New York Times? It was given to those three because they all share a certain sensibility about the relationship between commerce and a newspaper. Here's the weird thing, though. The Guardian is owned by nobody. Again, think about that for a minute. How does that work? It's really odd. It is owned by a trust. And all the trust does, and the trust is 12 people, they can, the only thing they're asked to do is to appoint the editor. The Guardian newspaper has been around for 180-something years, and it has had eight editors in 185 years. One editor was the editor for 58 years. And, and the current editor is a man called Alan Rusbridger, and Google him, he's a genius. He's been the editor for the last 16, 17 years, and he's still a young man. He's still in his mid to late 50s. So it's about continuity, it's about knowing why you're there. And the other principle is that comment is free, facts are sacred. And that was said in 1921 in a column that the man who was editor for 58 years said. Now, that's an amazing foresight, because at the moment, if you look in the blogosphere, it's comment everywhere. Everyone has an opinion, everyone has a comment, but very few people have the facts. Very few. And that's why facts are really <laughs> sacred. And I can ask you all your opinion on Arsenal Football Club. Okay? I love Arsenal Football Club. So I could ask your opinion on it, you would all give me opinion. But the fact is, we're rubbish at the moment. <laughs> and we were fantastic every other year. And so I'm dealing with the facts, not with the opinion. Although the opinion's very interesting. So when it comes to marketing this newspaper, and this is a newspaper that has a real tradition, it's very progressive, and the relationship between the marketing department and the editorial team is like this. It's very tight. We know exactly what they're doing, they know exactly what we're doing. And we talked about the brand positioning. So what is the brand positioning of The Guardian? And I'll talk about that. It's about comment is free, facts are sacred. It's about liberal journalism in perpetuity. And then to sell the, to, to sell the newspaper, apart from news, we develop lots of products which we put in the newspaper, and I'll show you those in a minute. And then there's lots of promotions. So on Saturday, if you buy the paper, you'll get this. If you buy the paper on Friday, you'll get that. So the marketing job is to stimulate sales of the paper and to stimulate page impressions on the website. And lastly, what's the tone of voice, the look and feel? If you look at The Guardian here, The Guardian looks like this every day. And there was a decision made that The Guardian would not make it look like World War III happened every day. Because if you look at lots of newspapers, it looks like the world is collapsing every single day of the week. It's simply not true. Terrible things happen and you need to report them, but you need to report them with care and consideration. There's only one time in the last seven years that The Guardian had a single picture front page. And that was the year that, in 7th of July when the bombs went off in London and 53, 54 people died. It was awful. That's the only day when even when prime ministers come in now, they don't do a single front page. Because do you know what? A lot more than <coughs> David Cameron, although he's very important, happened yesterday in the world. And it was the job of the newspaper to report that. So the tone of voice is just keep it calm. Do not get hysterical. Because newspapers get hysterical very quickly. So the Guardian brand position, which I talked about, and again, if you're in any marketing department, you better work out what your brand positioning is because that is the basis of absolutely everything. And I think most organizations don't know this, or they don't know it well enough, and they don't stick to it, and they change it. They do one year's this, next year's this. The really, really good organizations, and the ones that are most successful, understand their position in the world incredibly clearly, whether that's Coca-Cola, whether it's, I don't know what the brand positioning of this is, but it will have one, and if it's successful, it's because it sticks to it over a period of time. The Guardian's brand positioning was the view from all sides of the spectrum, economic, political, and social, an obsession with the separation of fact and opinion, because they're not the same, and I've touched on that. So make sure that our readers know when we're talking about facts and when we're talking about opinion, particularly on the website. The biggest development upon the website, and you know the chart I showed you about the development of brands, Within newspapers, what that means is mass engagement.